Friends, grace to you and peace, and welcome to worship here at Edgewood Presbyterian Church online um, here on the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. If you have not been with us uh, the last few weeks, we have been working through a preaching series. I'm not normally a preaching series preacher, but uh, we've had some fun with this one. Um, it, it, it emerges from this book called God, Improv, and the Art of Living by the Reverend Marianne McKibben Dana. Uh, she will be our guest preacher next Sunday. Um, and we have been taking the lessons from that book about uh, the world of improvisational comedy, these sort of themes, and connecting them to our scripture and uh, the, life of, uh, the life of faith in following Jesus. And so uh, we will hear from the Gospel of Mark today. Friends, I hope you feel welcomed here in this uh, community of faith, this wonderful community of faith. I want to give you three quick worship notes First, this service is being recorded and so uh, and will be posted to YouTube later. So if your camera is on, you may be on YouTube. Um, but you can put your prayer requests in the chat feature here on Zoom. It should be at the bottom of your screen. And we'll share those prayers later with Lynn Frenet as our Deacon of the Month. And that each Lord's Day we uh, have a... Whoops. Each Lord's Day we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. And so I invite you to find... Uh, some bread and a cup or something like that, something you can break and something you can uh, raise and drink later on in the service. Um, having said the, all of that, I invite you now to prepare for worship, to open your hearts and minds uh, for the presence of God as we listen to this prelude from the choir. Psalmist writes, you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. I invite our liturgist, Sid Burgess, to uh, now lead us in the call to worship and the prayer of the day. Beloved, children of God, arise. Jesus, our Lord, is coming near. He reaches out to us with healing. He raises us up to new life. Let us approach our God together. We are the people of God, chosen and claimed and called. Let us pray. Holy God, giver and sustainer of life and healer of our hurting world, you reach out to us with grace, calling us to get up and follow you. Give us the faith that makes us whole so that dying and rising with Christ, we might, we might partake of the great feast of abundant and everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn is a classic, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
right? Are we not here? Are we not seeing the hymn? Is that the problem? Somebody give me a thumbs up if you saw that hymn and thumbs down if you didn't. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Trying something a little new today and uh, clearly that was a good idea. So give me a thumbs up when you see it. No, yes, no, nobody sees anything. All right, one more time. Boy, I tell you, it's always something. Nobody sees that on the screen. Yes, yes you do. Somebody give me thumbs up. All right. I'm gonna play it and we're gonna try it.
Friends, God calls us to rest in grace, to let down our guard, and be truthful about ourselves and the world. The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Let us join our voices together in a prayer confessing our brokenness. Emma, will you give me a thumbs up that you can see the prayer? Okay, good. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we confess that we have not lived for your glory. We follow the crowds around you, but fail to grasp the good news you offer. We weep at the power of death, but laugh at your promise of new life. Forgive us, God of grace. Heal us of all doubt and despair and give us the gift of faith by which you make us whole. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up to fly like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored to new life. Now it's time for Lily to offer the sermon from the steps. And so I will unshare these pesky screens and uh, let her take over. Take it away, Lily. Good morning, friends. How are y'all doing today? In the middle, in between. Cool. All right. So <laughs> fair. Um, I want to raise your, I want you to raise your hand if you have a name. Who has a name? Oh, cool. I have a name. Yeah. Wait, that's kind of a silly question to ask, isn't it? We all know we have names. Heavens. Because uh, those names are pretty important, especially like at school or going to the doctor. Those are pretty important information, pieces of info to have. Um, but as a silly, it's a silly question. But we also go by a lot of different names depending on who we're around. My entire first name is Lily Ann. Um, but it's sort of, people don't really know what to do when you have two first names as a first, as one first name that really confuses some people. So when I was in maybe fifth grade or sixth grade, I started going by Lily so that, um, people I didn't know weren't so confused. Um, so I've gone by Lillian, I've gone by Lily, and I also have nicknames. A lot of my friends call me Lil and my mom calls me Bug. And I'm also a teacher. And so all of my students call me Miss Kane. That's just, you know, what we typically call the, or the teachers, the bosses in our lives. We call them Miss or Mr. and then their last name. Um, so yeah, we all have a lot of different names and that's, that can kind of be confusing, but I bet that y'all understand that and know the different names that y'all go by with different people too. So in our Bible story today, Jesus is in a place that honestly seems sort of creepy to me anyway. There are even a lot of pigs there, which I find interesting. And I don't think they're like pigs in, uh, you know, like Wilbur in Charlotte's Web, if you've ever seen it or read that story. Wilbur's a cute, like sweet, pretty pig. And I would, I kind of want to be friends with Wilbur. I want to have a pet like Wilbur, but I don't think these pigs are like Wilbur. I think they're sort of big and gross. And I think we also have to be careful around them. I don't think it's good for uh, our safety to be around them. So there are these creepy gross pigs and then this sort of weird town. And then of course, Jesus is there go figure, right? We know this Jesus dude comes up a lot and Jesus goes to this place and this man is there and this man has demons. 
And that's a, that's a really strange phrase. So I want to talk about the man who has demons. So if you don't know what demons are, demons are things like a monster or ghosts or ghouls. They're sort of scary things. But when I'm thinking about it, when they're saying this man has demons, I'm not feeling like this man has a box or a container, a jar that he unleashes these demons on when he gets angry. That doesn't make much sense to me. And then I remembered that there's a phrase people say sometimes. There's a phrase that people use. They say, oh, I have my demons or, oh, that person, he has his demons. She has her demons. And what that means is some sad things or some scary or bad things might have happened to that person. And they don't really know how to move on in their lives without that sadness or that madness. And I think that's really more what they mean about this man with his demons, that some really sad, scary things have happened to him and he doesn't know how to deal with them. And he may not treat people well because of that. So Jesus comes to this man with his demons and in this crazy town with these pigs. And I find it interesting that Jesus encounters this man who's sort of scary with his demons and says, what's your name? I think that's kind of an interesting question to ask because I personally would not ask that. I would probably run or hide behind a tree until the man with his demons walked away. That's what I would do. But Jesus stops and asks him, what's your name? And then the man answers, my name is Legion because there are many of us. And Legion is actually a word that means many of, a lot of, a multitude of. And he says his name is Legion because there are a lot of people in this town like him. A lot of people with demons, bad things have happened to them and they don't treat people well because of the things that have happened to them. As we know, when people talk to Jesus about the things that are bothering them, Jesus takes that really seriously. And so he talks to this man with his demons, to Legion, and says that the love from God and from him that he gives to others can help people deal with the things that trouble them. And after Jesus works with this guy, he feels a lot better. But as we know, Jesus ends up helping a lot of folks and he can't stay here for very long. So he has to leave this town. And this man with his demons begs Jesus to take him with him out of this land. And Jesus says, I can't do this. But what you can do is you can go to your town with all these people and tell them that God's love can make them better. And if they treat people with God's love, that they can get better too. All right, friends, we've come to that point. You know, if you've done a sermon with me that I like a weekly challenge. So here we get my challenge for you this week is to talk to God and Jesus about your stuff. You can find a space in your house. Remember, sometimes it might be better if it's a place where you can be by yourself. I can't really focus with a lot of people and talking and like TVs and stuff. I just can't focus. So maybe you can go somewhere in your house where you're by yourself. And then of course, get comfortable. Maybe you can lay down. Maybe you can sit. You can do the splits, whatever you like to do, as long as it's safe and comfortable so you can focus and talk to God about your week, about the day you've had the things that are good about it and the things that are bad about it. Because if you have those conversations and you're able to deal with them in some space where you're safe and quiet, maybe you can have a better day. How are we with that challenge? Does that sound good? Cool, all righty. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for names. First names, nicknames, nicknames and names we don't understand and names we don't understand help us know help us know that your love that your love makes us better makes us better and strong and strong you love us you love us we love you we love you amen amen thank you lily i love the challenges right okay we will have for the week ahead. All right. Um, Sid is going to come back on and lead us in the
prayer for illumination and the psalm. Let us pray. Spirit of truth, breath of life, as the word is read and proclaimed, teach us what we need to know. Inspire us, breathe in us and through us. Lead us with your fiery presence so that we may follow you without fear. Amen. Amen. Psalm 30 is a beautiful song of thanks to God for rescue from despair. Please join me in reading it responsibly. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought, you brought up my soul from show restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you God's faithful ones, and give thanks to God's holy name. For God's anger is but for a moment. God's favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. All right, folks, I know you're not seeing the psalm. Um, this is clearly a separate issue from what we've had the last two weeks. Um, so it'll be another fun week for me trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, but I invite you, even if you can't see it, to listen now to the gospel lesson from the gospel according to Mark. Um, I think you know the story because you heard it from Lily a little bit. Um, kind of what you need to know going in here is that Jesus is uh, traveling. This, this story takes place immediately before the story we heard last week with Jairus' daughter and the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' cloak. Um, this is just before that, and they are on the Sea of Galilee, and they go to the air, the country of the Gerasenes, which we, uh, the, uh, the important part to know is that these are, this is Gentile territory. So the people that Jesus meets there are not Jewish, but, um, but Gentiles. And so listen for God's word to us from the gospel according to Mark. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. 
when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed before, bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swineherds ran off and told in the city and in the country what they had seen. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to see Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. This is the gospel of Christ for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Give me a thumbs up if you're hearing me okay. Excellent. Just making sure. Never know what issues we're running into these days. Minimum hiking, maximum marshmallow. That is the camping motto of my 13-year-old goddaughter who lives in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin. She was supposed to come visit this past summer with her sister and her mom and her dad. Now, Lizzie is obsessed with astronomy, and so we were going to head up to Huntsville to see the rockets and to convince her that she ought to go to space camp. Of course, that visit got canceled along with their marshmallow-infused camping trip later in the summer. But Lizzie is the kind of kid who looks for the awesome in everything. And so she told her mom the other day, she said, last summer, we just kept having to delete things from the calendar. But this summer, this summer, we have nothing planned. And so if vaccinating and vaccinations go well, we get to add things all spring. Maybe this will be the summer of adding. Well, that idea warmed my heart and got me dreaming of, of seeing people, of, of hugging humans and, and visiting my family in New York and, and, and planning trips to see friends in Chicago and, and, and going to baseball games and buying concert tickets. As we have been forced to let go of things this past year, we have learned to hold some things more loosely than we had been. Like having the perfect plan and a, a detailed itinerary for the weeks and months ahead. Now, admittedly, that is more of a struggle for some of us than for others. But we've all been reminded of the value that comes with living in the moment. Jesus didn't plan his three-year tour around Galilee like a concert promoter. Now, broadly, we know that he would make intentional trips 
into Gentile territory like this one into the land of the Gerasenes. And we know that he would in, in the end need to go to Jerusalem. But otherwise, by and large, Jesus went to see what and who he would find. And along the way, he met all these, these characters, fishermen and, and tax collectors, rich and powerful people, women with reputations and, and problems that no physician could solve. He met the weary, the dying, the hungry. He met know-it-alls and, and, and seekers of new wisdom. He met beggars and scholars and out-of-towners and local yokels. He met the blind. He met lepers. And he met this man, this man so deeply troubled as to be restrained with chains and then banished to the tomb, to the tombs, the tombs where at least the dead couldn't reject him meets all these characters, these people who, who show up. And these people who show up give Jesus the opportunity to tell stories, to challenge, to ask questions, to feed, to heal, to bless. This gospel that we have could have just been a list of sayings of Jesus, along with a description of how very impressive he was and how we all ought to believe in him. But that's not what we have. Instead, our gospel is the story of the mostly unnamed people who meet Jesus and of what happened in those encounters and how those encounters transformed lives. It's the story of the people who met Jesus. In God, Improv, and the Art of Living, Marianne McKibben Dana follows the principles of yes and from two weeks ago and training your vision from last week. She follows them by pointing out that improv is rarely a solo exercise. That we are called to work together to create a more rich and interesting and just and holy life. Together. Finding your troop, your company, your ensemble, your scene partners. Well, that means being ready to share creativity and curiosity with those who seek to do likewise, who are generous and attentive. And it also means being prepared to be generous and attentive with those who, who push our buttons and, and who won't or who can't be improvisers. As Marianne points out, and now she's talking about improv, but we know this is even more true of church, you never know who will show up. The first thing we're told about this man of the tombs is that he has been pushed outside the community. They tried. They really, they really tried, y'all. They tried to restrain him. But he broke the chains. And now he spent his nights and his days where he could hurt no one but himself. He and his demons worked it out among the dead far as they could get from the living. And yet when Jesus arrives in a boat, the man goes to him. We know well the refrain from the first creation story, right? And God saw that it was good. But then we get the second creation story in Genesis 2. And God has made the Adam, the dirt man, who we've come to call Dusty. And, and God says, it is not good that the man should be alone. We are built for relationship, for interaction, for conversation, for collaboration. And so good news ought to ring in our ears. It is not all your responsibility. You don't have to do it all alone. There are a bunch of improv games that involve one person stepping out and doing some action until another member of the group, the class, the troop, the congregation, until another member jumps in and lets them off the hook. 
I still sweat thinking about having to play a game called Hot Spot in the improv classes that I took. We would form a, a circle and someone would have to step into the middle in faith and they'd have to start singing a song, any song. And they would continue singing until someone else jumped in to replace their teammate and start singing a different song that made some connection, however tenuous, to that last song. And so on and so on. The game was stressful for me for two reasons. First, my knowledge of pop popular music has been on pause since approximately 2002. And I'm famously bad at remembering lyrics that weren't written by Bruce Springsteen. You can ask Amanda, she'll tell you. I don't know the lyrics to any of our hymns. Um, and so I would stress out. But, 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 but here's the thing about these on the hook games. If you have formed any sort of community with the people in that circle, you end up with an almost physical need to help out your teammate, a need that overtakes the anxiety of making a fool of yourself. You can't let them just sing in the middle forever. And so you forget about being cool. Coolness is the opposite of improv and creativity, I think. And so you are forced by your very nature to say yes and. And somehow the, the I of, of I am uncomfortable, I am scared, I am stuck. Well, it gives way to the we of, of, of we are in this together and we can figure this out. And we are having fun. We can find a path forward. Marianne writes that in orientation to life in which the we is more important than the I, well, that requires mutuality and compassion and humor and risk, which sounds a lot like what the Lord requires of you. Jesus arrives in the country of the Gerasenes and finds a man whose community has failed him, has given up on him, has left him standing alone. And we understand because he wasn't safe to be around. He was scary. He was unnaturally strong. He howled. And those ancient people with their ancient unenlightened ways, they pushed him out of their city, out of their view out of their system, out of the way. Our improv teacher, Chris, called forward Hugh and Madeline to start a scene. And there was one requirement for the scene. One of them had to offer the other an actual gift. And then they would let the scene determine what the gift was and for what occasion. Well, Madeline immediately started pantomiming what looked to me like she was either building a, a sand castle or a snow fort. Either way, it was big what she was building on the floor. Hugh entered and said, wow, is that for me? You remembered Arbor Day. Thank you so much. And Madeline flashed a smile and said, you are so welcome. I got you what you've always wanted. And then she froze. And it quickly became apparent to the rest of us that she wasn't thinking sand castle or snow fort, that she had no idea at all what she had been pantomiming. Hugh was about to jump in and help her when she blurted out, I got you what you always wanted. I got you dirt from Israel from somewhere in the recesses of Madeline's brain, a very large pile of dirt from Israel had emerged as something that someone might have had on their wish list. And it was funny, but the magic happened when Hugh got very excited and rattled off a whole bunch of plans for his dirt pile from the Holy Land. We loved it. At the end of our class, a few weeks later, when we were offering a, a performance for the very carefully selected group of family and friends. Our little troupe was introduced by Chris to the stage 
ladies and gentlemen. Dirt from Israel. The improv lesson there was about receiving what was offered and rejoicing in it, working with it, playing with it, accepting the unexpected detour and seeing where it led. Instead of shrugging your shoulders and casting the gift out into the graveyard of weird ideas. How many times did Jesus answer a question with, no, that's nonsense. It's not on the agenda. No, he always works with what and who is before him. From the ridiculous to the profane to the heartbreaking, Jesus will respond with a question or a parable or an act of great mercy or a miracle or a meal. Did you hear all the begging in these 20 verses from Mark? The man begs Jesus not to send the spirits out of the country. The spirits beg Jesus to send them into the swine. The witnesses are afraid of what they've seen and they beg Jesus to leave the neighborhood. And the relieved man begs to go along with Jesus. And to this cast of characters and their begging, Jesus replies by taking the detours that his scene partners have offered and then adding to them. The spirits offer the suggestion of the swine and Jesus goes with it. And those swine end up in the water. He is asked to leave and the man wants to come with him and Jesus departs, but he gives the man a mission field. Marianne notes three types of improvisers in most troops. See if you recognize any of these in our congregation or your family or any other group troop that you are a part of. We always have the pirates. These are the big personalities, the zany ones, the bold ones, the often loud ones. Uh, think John Belushi or, or, or Will Ferrell. In the Gospels, we have Peter, who is always stepping out with an idea, even if it makes absolutely no sense. The pirates are the id of the troop. They bring color and big ideas. And as my goddaughter might say, they're sometimes a bit much. Along with the pirates, we have robots. Now, these are not robotic people. These are the people who make things happen. They are grounded. They keep everything grounded. They make sure things move along, that the bills get paid, that things don't go completely off the rails, that we don't get stuck. You might think of Martha in the Gospels. The robots are oh so crucial, and sometimes they get the biggest laugh. To the pirates and the robots, Marianne adds the ninjas. These are the folks who are generally kind of quiet, they're patient. They make small movements and they wait for a need or an opportunity to, opportunity to arise. And then they do something subtle or imperceptible, but crucial and transformative. The ninja lacks ego. They seem to get joy in making everyone else better. In the Gospels, we have Thomas who says so little, but his words have such big impact. And for those of you who've been around for a while, uh, I think of Ninja Millie Albright. If you are a ninja, relish and hone your gift for precision. If you are a robot, give thanks that you've got it together better than most of us and celebrate and be the best robot you can be. If you are a pirate, rejoice and make sure to listen to those robots. Y'all have chosen your troop, either by careful selection or, or by staying with the group that got you here, or by succumbing to the irresistible grace of your community. Your job is to listen and to receive and to offer and to believe that together there is an adventure worth pursuing ahead. That the situation that you find when you arrive at the shore need not be permanent. That the people you encounter, 
be they upright citizens or tomb dwellers, that they have something to offer and that they are worthy of your ear and your heart and your creativity. That before you always is the opportunity to tell stories, to challenge, to ask questions, to feed, to heal, to bless. Amen. All right, we are going to try to sing another hymn. And you're going to tell me, Emma, when you see slides on a screen. Do you see anything? You're not giving me a thumbs up or down. Thumbs down, okay. Let's try this again. I don't know what is going on, y'all. Any luck? Nothing, nothing. Oh, well, there are no words yet because the song hasn't started. Okay. <laughs> All right, but you see there, there the, the image in the back. Okay, good. Well, here we go. Now we're going to sing a hymn. And the hymn is uh, There in God's Garden.
Friends, in the gospel, according to John, our Lord says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let us all now share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Peace. Excellent. All right. As the piece continues to make its way around, I am showing you some slides, but I wonder if you can see them. Can you see them? Yes or no? Okay, good. Um, here are a couple of, uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, we are feeding our neighbors. We have our lunch group meeting at 3 o'clock today. Uh, to pack up some sack lunches for tomorrow. Thank you to all who have uh, brought groceries during the week. Um, we'll send out a new list tomorrow with what our needs are for the following week. Uh, BYG meets today. We had to postpone our, our spring kickoff from last Sunday with the rain. The sun is emerging now, and so we should be good to go. 4 to 5.30 at Southminster Prez, um, our kickoff for the spring games and Bible study and energizers and all the good things. Um, masks, again, are required, uh, and you're invited to bring a chair to sit on because we're in the parking lot, um, and a water bottle would be a good idea too. 4 to 5.30 at Southminster today. Now, I have put up this slide that I hope you can see, which is a uh, the poster for the main event, uh, which starts tonight with a worship service at 5 o'clock. Um, and so all the links uh, to this, uh, all the links for the uh, different workshops and the and the worship service are on the Presbytery website, which is, if you just Google Presbytery of Shepherds and Lapsy, you'll get it. But it's pslpcusa.org, and then you just look for the main event tab, and you will find those links. If you have trouble, text, call, email me, whatever, we'll figure it out. Worship service, just a simple prayer service tonight at 5, and then you can see that there are workshops Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week. There's no registration required, no fee to come to these things. Um, you just you just show up by clicking on the Zoom links on the on the Presbytery website, and I will send that link out tomorrow in the weekly email uh, for uh, the link to the Presbytery website. Um, but I hope that you'll, uh, if you're able to, uh, take the opportunity to join us for one of one or more of these workshops. We have our regular uh, Zoom groups this week. Kids Zoom meets tomorrow, Choir Tuesday, Thursday Night Live. We are uh, really enjoying this Creating Bigger Stories series with Renee August, um, South African Episcopal Priest, Friday the Men's Bible Study. And then uh, next Sunday, y'all, next Sunday we will worship here um, and we'll have a guest preacher uh, who is preaching for both congregations, and so she's sending in a video. Um, but uh, our, our guest preacher will be the Reverend Marianne McKibben Dana, author of the book that we have based this whole series on. Um, and so I, I, I hope you'll be here for that and 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 hear Mar uh, hear it from the author's mouth, uh, the preaching of the good news. Friends, I want to thank you for your continued support of the congregation and the stewardship folks, the finance folks have asked me to remind you in visual form of how you can give to the congregation. Of course, you can always send a check to the church, um, but uh, you can find on our website, edgewoodpc.org slash giving, or just look for the link that says giving at the top. Um, and then we use this Give Plus app, which is uh, uh, secure and through the Presbyterian Foundation. All right. Thanking you for all those good gifts. I invite you now to collect uh, the holy gifts of bread and cup uh, that we will share in just a second. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. It will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. We remember that our Lord Jesus, when he was at table, when the when he was uh, the risen Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he blessed it and he gave it to them and suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and so we see to recognize one one another at this table, this table of Christ, this table that extends from this church building into all of our homes. This table, which is not an Edgewood table, not a Presbyterian table, but Christ's table. And so you are invited. Let us pray. 
Holy God, in the beginning of time, your wisdom danced through creation, calling forth light and life. Through wisdom, you formed us in your image, calling us to love and to serve you. But we turned from you and abandoned your ways of justice and mercy. You chose not to reject us, but continued to call us and claim us as your own. You freed us from Egypt. You fed us in the wilderness. When we had no home, you led us into the land of your promise. When we worshipped idols of our own making, you called us through the prophets to turn back to you. And you emptied yourself of power and came to us as the child of Mary, holy God in frail and human flesh. You are holy, O God of power and might, and blessed is Jesus Christ, the one who comes in your name. In his life, he called unlikely people to follow him and be part of his troop. Fishermen, tax collectors, children, sinners, deniers, betrayers. On the cross, he gave himself up to the powers of this world, showing in his body your great foolishness, O God, for loving such a wayward world. Yet by this very cross, O wisdom from on high, you have undone and remade the wisdom of this world, drawing light from darkness, power from humiliation, life from death itself. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we proclaim together the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Come then, life-giving spirit, brood over these bodily things and make us into one body with Christ, that we who are baptized into his death may walk in newness of life, that what is sown in dishonor may be raised in glory, and what is sown in weakness may be raised in power. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. As the beloved people of God, we are now bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving grace of our Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Come now to the welcome table. I invite you to break your bread visibly and to partake, saying, I recognize Christ in you. and then to raise your cup in a holy toast, saying, my heart is burning for God's people. Let us continue in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of bread and cup. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world. Amen. Lynn Frenet is our deacon of the month. I'll ask Lynn to now share with us the prayers that are gathered in the chat. It looks like we have one prayer request from Susan Hammock, and it is a prayer request for her friend, Sandra who is suffering from ovarian cancer. We certainly keep Sandra in prayer. Friends holding that prayer and the uh, prayers that are in our hearts, let us pray. 
We pray to you, O God, O well, overwhelm us with your love, which casts out every fear. If love is how we know you, O God, remind us this day that love is what set the world in motion. Love is what spoke order into the chaos at creation. Love is what breathed life into being. Let us know the love that brings us life and life abundant. So if love is how we know you, we pray to you, O God, overwhelm us with your love which casts out every fear. If love is how we drive out fear, then we cry to you for the fear that leaves people unable to change this world. For the fear in war-torn communities and broken families, for the fear of losing life, the fear of rejection, the fear of empty chairs, for the fear that tells us we don't belong, for the fear that makes us selfish. Drive out fear and remind us that your love is stronger even than death. So if love is how we drive out fear, we pray to you, O God, overwhelm us with your love, which casts out every fear. If your love is how we love others, then we ask you this day to bless us, that we might be a blessing to others, to challenge us that we might grow deeper in your love, to guide us as we stumble forth as your children, to lead us as we love boldly in your holy name, Make us into the bearers of your love. So if your love is how we love others, we pray to you, O God. Overwhelm us with your love, which casts out every fear. And cast us out into our work and into our world with the task to be your hands, your feet, your love, your people your troop. Amen. Our final hymn is When the Lord Redeems the Very Least. Sing.
Ah, I love that one. <laughs> now, friends, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Alleluia. Oh.